What is going on guys? Joey Franzo here at Flex Training Systems and today I decided to take the video or the questions you guys sent me on Instagram and just turn it into a video. Uh, just like a Q&A and we're going to kind of go through it. There was a lot of really good questions. Some of them deserve their own video. Um, so I just tried to take the ones. I mean I could probably make a video out of every single one of these. But I'm basically just giving you a bunch of information hopefully in a short amount of time. Um, got about 13, 14 uh, topics here, so I'm just going to kind of run through it. Uh, first question was talking about dumbbell accessories versus machines. In general, when I think about accessories, the further away you get from the competition lift, possibly the less you know yield on your total it's going to bear. And you know you have to think about what are we doing in powerlifting. And what is your accessory doing? So if you're working a, st a machine, then obviously you're taking out the stability and you're just focusing on pushing the weight, right? In powerlifting, depending on the lift, there's going to be more or less stability, right? I mean, they all take stability. Um, bench and squat, I would say probably the most. Uh, but, you know, so dumbbell accessories are probably going to carry over better, a little bit better to your bench, give you a little bit of shoulder stability um, versus a machine. Machines are good if you have injuries, if you want to isolate something um, and, you know, you don't really have a specific like way to do that with a with a dumbbell or a free weight. Um, there's some really interesting creative machines out there that can, you know, that might be able to help you with with whatever it is you're trying to do. I really like machines for injuries. The more stability um, that you're gonna need is is probably gonna not be the best thing when you know you have an injury. You're trying to really isolate a muscle next to something that's hurt and, and not and not mess yourself up. The next uh, topic is um, hitting PRs on singles and rep PRs within a training block. Like basically, which one is more important? Which one do you track? Whatever. I'm gonna be 100% honest with you guys. Uh, rep PRs are nice, but I don't really I, I I don't really track them like I don't have to because if I'm following your singles and where they're going and what they're doing that's going to give me all the information I need and to be honest as long as you follow the I mean the way that we train as long as you follow the training and your RPs are solid and you're being objective and you're adjusting the weights as needed you're going to be good to go another thing and another reason why rep PRs can kind of be deceiving um, is because a smaller lifter will be able to do sometimes a lot more reps with the weight, but it doesn't necessarily translate to their one rep max. Um, the reason for that is because weight moves weight, and if you don't have a lot of weight on your frame, um, you know, for example, in the squat, you might be able to rep out, you know, a crazy amount of reps with the good with a decent weight, but then you add 50 pounds to that, and the curve, like that kind of strength curve, just falls off like crazy because now you're dealing with stability, you're dealing with physics, you're trying to deal with the plates oscillating. There's other factors that come into play um that uh that that is affecting your ability to lift that weight that's why sumo reps for example you know you might be able to lift crazy amount of sumo reps but your singles suck right i think squats probably a better example bench too um you know like a big guy might be able to just annihilate some big weight but he just sucks at reps right so you got to kind of have to keep that in mind, understand the type of lifter you're working with. Um, the farther away you get from a one rep max, the less valuable the rep PR is going to be. You get what I'm saying? Um, I think sets of eight are significant because it's a way to, I mean, it does so many things. I could do a video on its own on just sets of eight, but you know, you just got to keep that in mind. If a big guy is repping out rep PRs with sets of eight, it's going to mean more than a little guy, um, you know, that's, that's, that's doing that because that little lifter might have stability issues when they get up to those big singles. So it's just something you got to keep in mind. Um, next question or topic, how to carb load from meat if you aren't cutting? Really easy. The markers that I like to choose or, or focus on are um, so that week you want to make sure that you're hitting at your maintenance calories or slightly above or you know whatever carbs you would have in your macro setup and then really just two hours before the meet you're having you know a meal with carbs in it a, a sufficient amount of carbs 
maybe 20, 25% of your daily carbs, right? Then two hours later, you're competing, you're having some kind of fast carbs, um, and then you're good to go. For me, pancakes have worked in the morning. I've kind of gotten away from that because they make me sleepy a little bit. Uh, I like Gatorade, Pedialyte, stuff like that, um, sugars before lifting, and then you know maybe like a bagel or everything to kind of keep everything toge together. Um, that's me personally. You don't have to do what I do. Um, some people like pasta in the morning. Some people like, you know, uh, a sandwich. But I just try to say like, keep your fats low, and you want you want a stable carb. You know, a little bit farther out, closer to the meat. You want something fast, and then if you're still hungry after that, I mean, if you're doing a a well ran meat, you're going to be done in two hours. So you wouldn't, what you don't you don't really need to eat too much after that. But all week, you don't need to like super bulk up. I might tell people, you know, three days out, if you're not cutting, just have like one obvious you know big carb up meal that you that is that is a little bit more carbs than you normally would have um and 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 then stay off your feet like try to rest because that's just gonna make that food go to go to work more you're gonna recover better than if you're being super active next question uh why do top powerlifters do some top powerlifters watch anime now, I, I just think it's the same thing as if you watch a movie, if you watch literally anything that is, you know, po possibly fiction, some kind of inspiration, right? It's relatable. It, sh it shows an extreme version of, you know, something that might be related, rel relatable to you in life, overcoming adversity, overcoming challenges, you know, things like that in a show or, or some sort of fiction. And then you're drawing from that, you're using that to sort of empower yourself and just kind of put your head in the right place. So it is a, um, I, 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 it's like a, it's like a placebo. That's a powerful tool. It's not even a placebo sometimes because you could learn lessons from it and carry that over into your, into your lifting, into your life and things like that. So I think people underestimate, um, the power of being able to draw inspiration from anything, like literally anything. It's just a form of inspiration. If, if I were to make it, um, more relatable, right? I think anime just gets flack because of the way that it looks when, I mean, if you watch, if you watch wrestling, if you watch UFC, if you watch anything like that, they can all be different forms of inspiration. Um, next, qu next question, hard work versus talent. I'm just going to share with you guys. Uh, I think it was Phil Heath that said this, but basically what he was saying was hard work beats talent. Um, when talent doesn't work hard, but when talent works hard, it's game over. Uh, I kind of agree with that. I would like to add in s smart, right? You can have two people, you can have a hard worker that's smart and a talented person that works hard that's not smart and the hard worker beats them because they're just better methods, right? But yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it is in anything, right? You can have a champion that's been a champion for a long time, but somebody who j works just as hard as them, is just as intelligent as them, has a solid plan, and they're just more genetically gifted. They're gonna beat them, right? I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of like messed up because there's nothing you could do about it. Um, all else equal, right? So it is what it is. You, there's gonna be times when the hard worker, while that while that, uh, and I've seen it many times. I could drop names, but I don't want to because I, you know, these people are my friends, and I don't want to hurt their feelings, but. Um, I've seen instances of people far, far better. They're just a better powerlifter. Like that, that person is a better powerlifter, but they don't have a right, the right plan. They don't know what they're doing with recovery. They're just kind of doing whatever. And although they have an incredibly high base of strength, they get beaten by others um, that have perfect, per perfection, perfect plan, perfect execution. You know, <coughs> not as gifted genetically, but but pretty close. And then they edge them, right? So. It doesn't mean just because you're the most talented, you're going to always win. Um, next question, did I read solo leveling? No, I have not. A lot of people keep bringing it up, and it does look interesting. I got a list of things I want to kind of get into, and I just need things to slow down. Um, but I've just been grinding on this powerlifting journey, and uh, we got a lot of stuff coming up. So it's just hard to kind of get into fiction. But I do want to have you know some downtime and, and get into that stuff. Or I just work perpetually and try to fit it in. Um, fast gainers versus slow gainers. Uh, okay, fast. So, so basically, what this is to me is, if you're a slow gainer, like it's hard for you to gain weight. You just need to eat more. Um, I think, I think, uh, 
it's hard because it's a habitual thing, right? Um, there's a lot of things that go into that, but if you don't have good habits and you just have issues gaining weight, you just need to eat more. And I know it's like, uh, it's cumbersome. It's not fun. Um, but it's just gains on the table that you're missing, right? Change your habits, eat more food and, and find the foods that you can eat in, in a large quantity. Um, that's going to allow you to, um, just like have a steady stomach so that you're not like, Oh, I feel sick. I'm going to throw up whatever. You have to find those foods that work for you. Be consistent make it a habit, write notes down, put sticky notes somewhere and just stay on it. You cannot let up like you, your metabolism is really fast. It's going to want to handle whatever you give it. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of working harder. If you're a slow gainer, I mean, I mean sorry, a fast gainer. I mean, it's, it's not a problem. Like you could freaking look at food and gain weight. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's just, it's just doing what you have to do to put your body in a position, regardless of your metabolism. Like, it's what do you want? If you want to gain weight, then you have to eat more. You, it's it's and there's no way around it. It's about energy balance, right? How much are you outputting? How much are you inputting? What is your demand for protein and things like that? So, uh, that's my take on that. <laughs> Somebody asked, "What is the biggest mistake I've made in my life in 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 anything?" Right? Um, I mean, if I'm just talking from a monetary uh, perspective, um. I mean, back in 2017, uh, my brother was trying really, 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 really hard to get me to invest in Bitcoin. He was like, I remember the conversation. It was such a, it was such a, like a big thing that I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. Um, at the time, I just don't think he had all the tools to kind of convince me. Um, but if I had listened to him and did what he asked, I would be extremely <laughs> wealthy right now. <laughs> um, so from a, from a money perspective, you know, it's that, um, and, and, and the reason, you know, there's, of course, there's going to be a million opportunities like that. But the reason why I bring that one up is, is that it literally came to my face. Like it was right in my face and it was presenting itself to me and I just didn't act on it because I didn't do my due diligence. Um, and like that cost me a lot that cost me, you know. It'll, it'll kill you if you think about it like constantly because you're just going to lose your mind like, oh, I should have invested in this, whatever, this and that. But I mean, is what it is. He could now for the rest of my life, he could always tell me like, oh, I told you so, I told you so. And, uh, you know, that'll be that'll be like his little one up on me or something. OK, uh, so from a monetary perspective that, yes. Um, OK, what, what am I competing next? I would like to compete at the end of the year as a 242. Um, I think 242 is probably just best for me. It's my weight. Like it's literally my weight. It's my size. Um, I have some goals I'd like to hit there, but there are some, you know, deadlift has been a very hard challenge for me because of my back history and just the way that my genetics are like my dad and my brother and how we have long torsos and I have short arms and it's just hard for me to deadlift consistently. I did it for eight weeks. Um, and I ended up paying for it. I can squat no problem, and it's crazy because I can squat heavy, like heavy, heavy, like 700 pounds. That you guys see me, what I've done, and I've had this injury for like 10 years. Um, you know, confirmed on MRI. Doctors want to do surgery on me, but I just, you know, it's like a last resort. I don't want to do that, and I've been trying like really hard to deal with it, and it's just a pain to find kind of balance it. And what I think I might have to end up doing is I might just have to very very rarely pull sumo um and just have a shitty sumo like because conventional with any kind of intensity is just is very very difficult for me to do uh as an, like i think also the more weight that i lose i lose slack in I, I i gain more slack meaning i'm more mobile in my back i'm more mobile in my core when I was almost 260, I mean, uh, you put a belt on and my stomach wasn't going to move. Like, I was very, very protected. Um, but it's just with deadlift, because I round so much, the more weight that I lose, I can't, I literally can't get the belt tight enough to protect me. No matter how much core I do, all these things I've done in my whole life. And it's just, you know, it's it's something that uh, I constantly struggle with. And it's, it is a hindrance, um, you know, losing weight and like losing 20 pounds, you're going to lose a lot of like, there's going to be a lot of things about you depending on, you know, I, like I, I'd say 
I'd say like 260 to 240 to me, I'm a, I'm a different person. Like it's going to change my leverages a lot. I have more range of motion on most of my lifts. I have, um, like I said, more range of motion in my back. And those ligaments are just kind of not super tight. And I just round. So it's just something that I, I struggle with. And once I get this handled, I would like to compete at 242. In the meantime, I'm just focusing on being the best coach I can be, best mentor I can be, helping you guys achieve your goals. And, um, you know, yeah, that's my that's kind of my thing. Um, uh, set squatting at least 700 at 242 would be dope with, like, a small weight cut. Um, so, yeah, that is that is what I think about my competing next. I'm still training, still doing everything, just not deadlifting as much at the moment. Um, but yes. Okay. Two accessories for each comp lift. All right. Um, flat dumbbells and close grip bench for deadlift or sorry, squat. I would say single leg, leg press and dumbbell RDL. And then for deadlift, I would say beltless deadlift and high bar squat. If I had to pick two for each, I think with those, you could handle a lot of, uh, a lot of business. Um, you could sub, you could sub them out for close things, but I think those are those are really solid. You can't you don't really need too much more. I think with ten movements total, you could build an insane powerlifting total. You wouldn't really need much much more than that. Next question: Can you gain a deficit or sorry? Can you gain strength in a deficit? Yes, absolutely. Um, you just need to be very meticulous with your nutrition. You need to stay on point with everything. Your nutrient timings and your protein intake and your carb timings and all that needs to be really, really good. Otherwise, you're just going to have shortcomings. Um, it is possible, but there is, there will come a time when it is going to be extremely, extremely slow and hard. Um, so it's just not the best environment for that, right? But every situation is different. Everybody's different. It really depends what is that person like situation and what should they be doing to gain weight while making weight for a meet or whatever. Russ essentially does it every meet, right? Um, he has to gain weight, then he diets down, but he keeps his gains, a lot of them. Okay, next question. What is the biggest mental block in the sport? I think it just comes from fear. Like you're just afraid of failing. You're afraid of the unknown. You're you're not sure if you could do it. Um, just being afraid, being judged by your peers, normal, typical things that come with fear. And I think the best way to get over that is just do it more. You become numb to it. Um, you build up that confidence, having good preparation. If you do it in training a million times, you know, you can do it on the platform and that's going to bolster your confidence and mentally you should be able to get through that. Um, also like fear of injury. It's just fear, just being afraid. And I think overcoming that is huge for like success and consistency. Um, pros, cons, formula. So, okay. Basically the whole thing with formulas is like, if you – one formula is always going to favor one weight class over the next, and there's no perfect formula. I think there are some formulas that kind of do one thing better than the other, but nothing is perfect. And, you know, there's always going to be – there's always going to be something wrong. It's just so hard to make a formula that can, like, equate everything. I have yet to see a perfect one or one that works for everything. I mean, it, it just is what it is. So, yeah, I mean, we're just kind of struggling and bouncing around between them, right? I think in my time, I've seen this go from like three different ones. We had Wilkes, we had IPF points, now we're Dots. I mean, in three years, who knows, we'll be on some other shit. So, uh, last one here, IPF or USAPL. Um, It depends. I'm going to support both. I think for me as a competitor, I mean... I like I don't want to do 264 and I don't want to do 230 so 242 would work best for me um but if you want but there's like there's value in being a world champion and you should compete in the IPF if you do that I coach a lot of people in IPF I coach probably 50 50 right now ah maybe like 60 45 I don't know USAPL is good I think USAPL has uh, the best ecosystem for kids um, collegiates, teen nationals, juniors, it's, it's just the best. Like there's no, I haven't seen anything close to that. Um, again, in the IPF, those kids have an opportunity to compete at world. So, I mean, that's a thing. Speaking of which, um, I'm doing a little like contest bounty type of thing for people are competing at those meets. I'm going to do another video soon and I'll give more details on it. Um, what else? But yeah. Uh, I hope you guys are able to take something away from this video. A lot of the questions that you guys asked were like 
they were definitely like programming workshop questions. I don't want to like shield my own stuff, but like it's just easier for you. I can give you a very detailed, you know, literally two hour explanation. I could show you blocks. I could explain things. If you want to learn about programming, how to set up programming, where to put accessories, you know, anything like that, then you're going to want to take my programming workshop. If you're interested, I'll leave the email down below to inquire for that. Um, or you could just say I'm interested in the workshop and I'll send you the email. So there's that. Um, aside from that, guys, thank you so much for making it this far. Uh, that next workshop is going to be, I believe, January 29th. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm excited for this year. I think it's going to be crazy, assuming there's no um, lockdowns or anything. But, yeah, thank you so much, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.